Hello everyone, this is Barkay from D2C Wheel. D2C Wheel is an online community where we talk about direct-to-consumer brands, technologies and everything in the D2C world. In today's episode of D2C Wheel's podcast, we are together with Lynn Power, founder of Masami Hair Care. <laughs> so, hey Lynn, uh, it's a great pleasure Hi. to have you here on our studio. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. Great. Thank you for being here. Uh, so, Lynn, where are you dialing from? I'm in Palm Springs, California, where it is a balmy 110 degrees. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty bad. Uh, so, Lynn, uh, I did a little bit of stalking on your LinkedIn, and I saw that, like, to be honest, I was a bit intimidated. You, know? <laughs> you had a long and successful career before founding Masami. So, for our audience, could you tell us a bit more about what you were doing before founding your own thing? Well, you don't need to be intimidated because um, I spent 30 years in advertising and the industry has changed so much that I'm basically like a newbie now, right? Because it's a whole different world. So, um, yeah, I spent a long time um, in the ad agency world um, and I worked on amazing brands throughout my career in practically every category. But I kept going back to beauty. You'll see the the theme Mm -hmm. here. Um, and I just really enjoyed the beauty category and my, at the end of my career, I was, I was running agencies. I, I was the CEO of J Walter Thompson, New York, and my job had become quite bureaucratic as you can imagine working for a big holding company and a large agency. Yeah. Like, why did you like working with beauty brands? You know, I think it's because it's a blend of um, hmm, emotional, rational, left brain, right brain, because beauty is mm. selling both hope and emotion and aspiration, mm. but it's also it's also very functional in the sense that, you know, it's very rational. People want to see the results. They want to understand the benefits. Um, it's, 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 so like I said, it's, it's a good blend of, of both. Sorry, this is Enzo. And he likes to be part of everything I'm doing. Maybe. No worries. He can be a part of it. <laughs> so, like you were saying, it's a mix of good mix of right brain and left brain. It's a so good mix what... of right and left brain where you get to really, you know, think holistically about a brand, right? You have to think about that emotion, but you also have to yeah. think about the the tangible benefit, the value equation. If somebody's going to be spending a hundred dollars on a skincare, it better be worth it. Right. So, um, I like, I like that challenge. Yeah. So during your career, you had a chance to work with a lot of beauty brands, I assume. So could you give us some examples of those brands? Yeah. One of the, um, funnest things I did was work with Clinique and help them launch their TV campaigns globally because they had never done TV, Mm. believe it or not. They were known for those um, really iconic print ads. Um, so that was a really cool exercise to bring it to life in, in a video format. Um, we, I also worked with Nexus. I, I did L'Oreal's hair products, launched Natural Match, um, relaunched L'Oreal Vive for like the 10th time because that brand is <laughs> every couple of years gets relaunched. Uh, Lynn, I was going to ask you about... Uh, you know, why did you choose to move to your beauty vertical and start your own brand named Masami? So sometimes the universe kind of tells you what to do. <laughs> and in this case, yeah. I, I had left advertising in 2018 and actually started consulting and I was working with startups. And I really enjoyed that mm-hmm. because I got to really feel like I was making a difference in their business. And I'd gotten so removed from sort of that you know, using creativity to drive business because I was doing so much Mm -hmm. bureaucratic stuff. When you're the CEO, it's actually not very glamorous, by the way. Um, And so um, after I left, I actually met my co-founder, James, through my husband. James had been working on these hair care formulations for about 10 years. He um, spent a long career at Clairol and... um, he realized that there was a need for clean, super premium hair, hair care that was like really hydrating because he saw these models that had their hair fried from having it colored and then colored back sometimes in the same day and they would be crying. And so 
it took him about 10 years because it's hard to do. It's hard to do clean yeah. hair care that's high performing. And we wanted it to be hydrating, but have weightless hydration, not weigh your hair down. So um, yeah. most hydrating products on the market, yes, they may solve that issue, but they're going to leave your hair looking greasy or limp or whatever. So anyway, so I met James um, and his husband, Masa, who we named our brand after. And he had formulations, mm -hmm. but they were like 80% there. We needed to clean them up a bit. We needed to do consumer testing. We obviously had to brand um, our, our, our company and our line and then create our e-commerce commerce footprint, our go-to-market strategy and all that other stuff along the way. Yeah. Like I was going to ask if you had a technical co-founder who came up with the formulation, but like you mentioned it before I ask it. So <laughs> how did this like dynamic relationship between you and your partner work for you in the very beginning? It's actually been great because we have very complimentary, complimentary skill sets. Um, so, you know, yeah. he knows a lot about the formulations. He's not a chemist, but he's done so much research and he knows so much that he gives the chemist basically exactly what he wants. Um, yeah. And then, and then I do all the commercialization, the, you know, running the business, the marketing, basically the everything day to day. Um, which, which he really doesn't have any experience. And so, you know, in that yeah. sense, it's a really good partnership. And I always tell people who are looking to launch a business, find a partner that um, is a complementary partner, not a clone of yourself, because more often than not, the partnerships that are clones, I see yeah, them start to step on each other's toes, you know, get in each other's yeah. way. Um, I mean, it can work if it's like, your twin or your best friend, but like a lot of times it doesn't work. So think about that. And just because it is very hard to find a comp like a partner that have complementary skill sets to you, many people choose to do you know, solo founding their businesses and they, they find it even more difficult, you know, because they're spending so much time yeah. on operational stuff. They're spending so much time on marketing, customer support and everything. And eventually they, like they basically mess up and they come up with different partners and everything. So uh, like, it is great that you had a great partner in the very beginning. So how did you like, what were your first steps? How did you start? Where did you start from? So we started with getting our formulas, right? Then we did a whole bunch of yeah. consumer testing on every hair type and texture to make sure we actually had a product that people wanted and liked. And we wanted to be an yeah. inclusive brand. So we wanted it to work for everything from super thin, straight hair, which is like mine. Although this, my, this is my post chemo hair. I had breast cancer last year. And before that, my hair was long and thin, much thinner. It's much, it's thicker now, which is weird, mm. but good. Um, I'm not complaining. Yes, um, that, yeah, but we wanted it to work for like 4C hair, which is very coily, coarse hair as well. So we did a lot of testing. Um, and then we really focused on the brand, the brand story, the brand values, making sure we had all that in place, because a lot of times people gloss over those sort of pieces of the brand um, and they just want to focus on the product. But if, if you don't get that right, it, it can create a lot of sort of dissonance when you're um, creating content and, and trying to create stories. If you don't really know your your core values. So we spent some time doing that, creating yeah. our brand name. As I said, our brand was named after my co-founder's husband, Masa Hiro, who's Japanese. And he's the one that mm. really found us our key hero ingredient, Mikabu, which is from the little town in mm. Japan in the Bay where he grew up. It grows there and they would yeah. eat it like we eat avocados, you know, every day. So, um, so, so Masa is a lovely human He's just a really Zen person. Um, and when we were thinking about what to name the brand, it just made sense. And then we realized that the name Masami means truly beautiful in Japanese. So it was like goosebump oh, yeah. moment. Yeah. And then it's tra it's available. Yeah, the trademark's true. available, which is always like, right? That's the <laughs> part of it. Yeah, that's that's a very nice story. So you brought your previous marketing and advertising experience to the table. Your partner brought the like formulation and everything. Um, like I was going to ask, how did you, you know, 
utilize, leverage your previous experience during your time at the Medicine Avenue companies? Um, I mean, so much of what you learn in advertising becomes just ingrained in the way you think. So, you know, I do always think mm. about the brand. I think about the brand voice. I think about, um, you know, the brand identity. I don't always execute it well because <laughs> I'm, you know, we have, it's me and one other person basically doing all of it. So sometimes I will be my own worst enemy and I'll choose, you know, get it done over, get it right. Um, but, yeah. but having that discipline to at least start off with that thinking is really, really helpful so that you can come at the business yeah. from a strategic perspective. Um, and then of course, knowing things like, well, you know, basic, you know, marketing principles, like, well, you kind of have to go where people are. <laughs> That's why we're on Amazon. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm not going to fight upstream when you don't have money to spend. So let's just go, go with the flow as opposed to go against it. Yeah. Like that's a nice story. Uh, so like, let's get into specifics now. Like you mentioned a lot about marketing advertisements. What uh, channels are you using for advertising Masami at the moment? So I love podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's here we are. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's and podcasts, by the way, the thing that people don't always realize they're evergreen. So those are out there. They're great for SEO and you get to tell a whole story, not just like a little clickbait piece of it, you know? So that's why I really like podcasts. But anyway, we also do the usual suspects, you know, we're on all the social channels, um, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Mm -hmm. YouTube now on threads on Twitter or X, whatever. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so we're, we're everywhere. Um, we've, we've dabbled in, um, paid advertising on, on those channels. We've, we actually do some paid advertising on Google and Pinterest because that actually performs the best for us. Um, Pinterest mm -hmm. in terms of efficiency of driving traffic to our website. And then we use Facebook to retarget because Facebook from a, from an ROI perspective, we found that just running Facebook ads was not efficient, um, but using it as a retargeting tool is a lot better. So um, that's just one thing we do. I see. Like, what were the what were the uh, metrics you had that made you think Facebook was not very effective by itself? Um, our our acquisition cost on Facebook was over a hundred bucks well over a hundred bucks. So that's yeah. just challenging. You know, when you're a small business, um, that's hard. Now, the other thing we've done that's been incredibly effective, but the best thing we've done by far has been brand partnerships, partnering with other like-minded mm. brands. In our case, maybe it's a clean skincare brand. We've partnered with a clean jewelry brand called Ally. We've, we've partnered with, um, all sorts of other, you know, there's a brand that makes, um, recyclable, towels out of recyclable uh, uh, plastic bottles called Once Again Home. And they're actually making um, some, we're doing a co-branded hair towel with them that I'm launching hopefully next month. So like those have been by far the best because we're, we've been able to grow organically with the right kind of um, customers and find, an, you know, our audience fairly easily. Um, so we do everything from, you know, blogs, giveaways, gift with purchase exchanges, live streams. We do a lot of live streaming. Um, I mean, you name it, I've probably done it with one of the other brands events. We'll do pop-ups and, and then that led to creating the conscious beauty collective, which is even our next iteration yeah. of how to take that to the next level. Yeah. Like just as I mentioned that let's talk about conscious beauty collective. So, uh, like you are leveraging your expertise in partnerships to drive sales and you have a community. And Conscious Beauty Collective. So can you tell us more about that? What are you doing there? What is your purpose? Yeah. So I actually came up with the idea when I was going through chemo for my breast cancer, because I would have these like six hour long mm -hmm. chemo sessions. And my husband's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, no, I need something to do and distract myself. Plus I'm sitting mm -hmm. here thinking, I want to focus on the things on my business that are actually working and moving the business forward. And I enjoy those don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can find that Venn diagram where it all comes together. So I wanted to find, so anyway, uh, um, so the Conscious Beauty Collective was about, yeah, doing things that I enjoyed 
and also driving the business forward and putting those two things together. And so I loved the partnerships I had done with the other brands. I loved some of the founders I met. Um, we started sharing and learning. And my thought was, well, instead of doing two or three at a time, if I could scale it and do 30 or 40 at a time, then I'm getting yeah. somewhere, right? Then I'm starting to make a dent because you start to add up our social impact from our social accounts, you know, and it's like close to a million followers between us. Whereas on my yeah. own, I'm 25, 30,000, you know, on Instagram. So it's like, that's, that's when it started to click. And I realized, well, there are a lot of founders like me. We don't have investors. We're self-funded. We don't have a lot of marketing money. So how can we kind of help each other? Um, and that's been awesome. Yeah. Like, uh, how did you meet with other founders that are just well, like yourself? Yeah. So there are a bunch I knew just from the industry, from being in advertising, I knew a handful. So I had already done stuff with them. And then it would be like, like basically in 2020, when we launched, because we launched a month before COVID lockdown, it was like pra pragmatic, right? Like I would do stuff with other founders and Becky Mercer, who was on your podcast before yeah. she and I used to work together in advertising. So she's an example. Yeah. I knew her. You know, like, so then it's like, great, let's do something. And then it would be like, so, you know, she'd introduce me to somebody. They'd introduce me to somebody else. Before I knew it, I had like 20, 30 founders that I knew. And so that when I had this idea, I floated it with a couple of the founders that I'd worked with. I'm like, hey, would you guys be interested in doing a pop-up? That was the original concept, like a pop-up store where we could get retail exposure. We could do some co-marketing, you know. And they were all like, absolutely. So I worked with Brookfield Properties, which is a very large mall owner in the U.S. They have about 300 malls across the U.S. And we came up with our first pop-up in Stonestown Galleria in San Francisco last year. It was April of last year. We were there three months. It was fantastic. Then we moved to Boston for the holidays. We were there four months. Then we just finished up in uh, Rancho Cucamonga in Southern California at Victoria Gardens. We were there three months. And what's happened is like, yeah. I'll have some founders that are part of it and then they'll introduce me to another founder. Or now that we're out there getting press and social, I have people just inbound, reach out to me and be like, hey, how do I get to be part of it? It's not yeah. for everybody because we do a lot. There's So it's, it's like the store is the hub, but then if you think about it as like, a hub and spokes. We do, you know, events, giveaways. We do um, other pop-ups together where we'll share a table. You know, we just do all this other stuff. And so if you're somebody that just like, oh, just take my products and just sell them. I don't want to deal with all that. You're not going to, you're not going to enjoy it because you'll get an email from me twice a week about some opportunity and it'll just annoy you. So I found that there are, well, there are kinds, different kinds of founders, right? I did have a few of those. Most of the founders that are part of it, that have been part of it from the beginning, that's the stuff that they love. Like, and we do a lot of ideation together. We do a lot of sharing. We do master classes where we'll share. We just did one on Amazon and we just did one on SEO where we'll share um, our learnings. And it's great because my superpowers are different than some of the other founders' superpowers. And so really being able to tap in what everyone knows, what they're good at, what, what they focus on, and share it with the group has been really liberating. It's our own little school. Yeah, it's nice to hear that. Uh, so how many active uh, founders do you have in your community now? So the, the last pop-up, we actually had 40. Um, but if I think nice. of all the founders we had, cause not everyone continues every time. Sometimes people have, you know, inventory issues or the location is a problem or they, you know, so I do tend to try to get more local founders for each location. Cause what I found is when founders yeah. are participating and actually do events in the store, it helps everybody. It's just good for yeah. everybody. So, um, that was one of my learnings is really, you know, see try to find people that can be more actively participating but probably over the course of the three pop-ups we've had about 100 founders participate 100 brands and now i'm looking at our next location for the holidays which i'm hoping knock on wood will be palm springs we'll see i'm knocking on glass does that count i don't know yeah i wish you all the best with that so uh like what what are the exact benefits of doing this pop-up shops 
So the benefits are, first of all, from a customer acquisition perspective, when people walk in the store, they tend to spend 30, 40 minutes. Mm. And a lot of times they just have a lot of questions. They don't know a lot about clean beauty. They don't know how to start. They don't know how to detox their beauty. They don't know what ingredients to avoid. They don't know ingredients to look for. And so just helping people through that process has been so um, fantastic because once they get in and they use the products, we have people come back and back and back and back. Of course, I drive them to, to the websites. I don't want them to come back in the store necessarily, but a lot of times yeah. they do. But um, so, so from a customer acquisition perspective of getting really sticky customers, customers who yeah. now you can literally have that deep conversation with and explain to them why they need this type of shampoo and conditioner and why sulfates in your shampoo are bad. And by the way, 90% of the products on the market still have sulfates. Why that's actually stripping your hair, why that might be causing some of your dryness and hair issues. Why, you know, like, and, and then they, they try, we give out samples. That's another benefit is, you know, you get to actually sample the products to the right people not just a random gift box or sample box or subscription box. You're actually like, you need the styling cream. So I'm going to give you this. Yeah. I want you to come back. Tell me what you think. And they do, they come back and they go, I love it. Or it didn't work for me or you know, whatever, but you get immediate feedback. So that has been absolutely gold. Like you just can't get that yeah. Um, yeah. anywhere else. Like in an online setting, when someone comes to your website, he or she spends some time on your website, try to understand what you're doing, basically. But when he or she comes into your store, your pop-up shop, he's, you basically have 30, 40 minutes of his or her time. And it's a great time to tell the benefit of your brand, what you're doing and everything. So in those pop-up shops, you display the products of uh, different brands from your collective right mm -hmm. and yeah. are you also doing you know bundles you know product placement those sort of old-fashioned retailing things yeah we do a lot of bundles the bundles work incredibly well because again if you create like a, a theme or a reason you know the sensitive skin bundle the summer skin bundle whatever people love it because it just takes the thinking out of it um obviously for yeah. gifting that's also a no-brainer so yeah, we do, we do bundles. We do, you know, things like products of the week. We do events in the store constantly at the last store. We were um, in an old Lululemon space. So it was big. It was 2,200 square feet. It was in Victoria gardens across from the Apple stars, prime location. Mm. But what we did is we nice. took those fitting rooms that were in the back because we don't need them. And we converted them into sort of a, um, an installation that educated about clean beauty so one was about water waste, one was about sulfates, one was a bin where you could throw your dirty product and exchange it for a clean one, you know, things like that um, to try to really engage people and get them to think more about what they're doing, what they're putting in and on their body, because that's really important. So like this, this way you are acquiring customers with uh, long, like high lifetime value and obviously with, you know, more AOVs, right? Average order cost, average order values. So yeah. this is a win-win for everybody. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, that's the, that's the goal, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the goal. So can we get back to the social media marketing side? You know, you mentioned you were using several platforms, Pinterest, Facebook, Google. Uh, what are your target audience look like in those ads? Yeah. So, um, so we do the retargeting with Facebook for Pinterest. It's a pretty broad audience because it's about generating traffic to the site. And it's so efficient that I find it's better to make it a wider reach. Um, and, yeah. and then there, it, you start to learn too, because going into this, I, I assumed like a lot of people do that my customers would be 25 to 35 sweet spot, you know, New York city, yeah. LA, more urban, more, you know, savvier, um, beauty lovers, obviously, but it turns out that they're more, Cal they're more West coast for sure. Cause it's a bit more of a clean beauty market and clean beauty perceptions. And they're older. They're like 30 plus. And the reason being mm -hmm. what I've figured out now is that 
if you're 25 or 30 and you have amazing hair because you are in the market and you care and you're a beauty lover, my product will only be that much better, right? It's You're going to use it. You might like it, but it's not going to be a big dramatic difference if your hair is awesome already. If you're over 30 and yeah. your hair is starting to thin and it's starting to dry out and you're coloring it a lot. I mean, I color my hair, so, you know, it fries your hair. So if you're, if you're somebody like that, then you're going to see a much bigger difference when you use our product. Literally overnight, yeah. people are like, oh my God, you know? And so they just, they just get a bigger, we get a bigger uptick in the product performance when people's hair is, is shitty. <laughs> <laughs> and like, how did you, how did you find out that your target audience was some other group than you were expecting initially? It was just kind of by trial and error, right? You know, you start to start wide and that's what I always say to people too, when they're starting out, don't, don't make the assumption, like start wide and see where, see where it takes you. Um, and if you find that, you know, pregnant women are buying a lot of your product, then do that. If you find that men and in our case about 40 percent of our customers are men because our products were intentionally gender neutral um and we don't mm -hmm. target men because they're harder to target but they find us and they love us they might find us through a girlfriend through a friend through somewhere else and men can be super loyal because men are a little bit more on autopilot they, they're not as fickle yeah. as women they find something that works for you you're going to just use it so I yeah, yeah. love when a, I see a guy buy our product, uh, you know, I am super happy about that. Like when you see a guy buying your product, you can be sure that for the rest of his life, he, he will be buying from you. Uh, Pretty much. So, yeah. So like you started wide, you started with a wide audience, but at the same time, this means, you know, spending more time on advertisements, right? Because you do not have a specific group. You are not targeting to a small group of customers. You are like, you're targeting a white group, right? Was that so? Like, why, were you spending a lot of time, uh, money on advertising initially? Um, not necessarily money because we did a lot of testing, right? So I would do different ads, different audiences, different formats, and do a lot of testing in the beginning to see what stuck. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because on some platforms, manual targeting was better on other yeah. platforms. When I let them decide and automate the targeting, it outperformed what I could do. Which, which platforms are those? So I would say on Amazon, man, their automated targeting is so much better than mine. I tried so many times to do ads where I did the manual targeting and they were always bad performing. And so I have a couple campaigns that I've been running on Amazon since we launched on there that I just leave on forever that are like catalog sales and product displays and Amazon targets it and gets smarter. I'm sure because they know that maybe somebody's buying a silk pillowcase and they're buying my hair. I, I wouldn't have thought that, you know what I mean? Like they just mm -hmm. have, have a way to find those weird connections. And so the, the spend I get on, on Amazon, is like 10x it's mm -hmm. really good now it's like, it's hard to scale it like that's the only thing but um on facebook i tried their automatic targeting it just wasn't as it just didn't really work and in that case you know it? right so it's like it's just you just got to play around with the platforms and and also this is hard for people and it's hard for me because i want to be able to just do something and scale it you can't, you know, every platform's different. You have to go in, you have to find those nuances. You have, that's where like on Pinterest doing a wide target makes sense. It wouldn't make sense on Facebook or Instagram because I've spent so much money on, on people that don't care about my product. Um, but on Pinterest, it's great. I'm driving traffic to the site and you do need eyeballs and traffic. And that's where a lot of, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're interested enough to click through to the site, they're a viable prospect as far as I'm concerned. Now, Pinterest users tend not to be Pinterest buyers. They tend to be browsers, yeah. but it's a process. You need to get, you know, 10 to 12 touch points before yes. somebody's going to convert. So that's the way I think of it is like, if Pinterest helps me with one or two of those touch points, because they're maybe seeing my ad on Pinterest and then they're going to my website, check, check, then I'm retargeting them. I'm going to eventually get them, you know? 
like I see this uh, this is a wonderful story of customer acquisition. So um, I was going to ask why did you like choose to start with Pinterest at the first place? Now why Pinterest? How did you get the idea that your customers will be there? Well, so many people are there, but it's it's a great place for education, but it's also cheap. Let's face it. If you're scrappy, mm -hmm. you need to find you need to find solutions where you can afford to do it and get enough people, you know? And so that's why I started dabbling there. And once I saw that, okay, it's not going to give me sales, but what it is going to do is drive people to the site. That's useful. Yeah. Let's make sure I'm using it the right way. And TikTok is also very cheap. Are you using TikTok ads? I have, I've only started dabbling with that. And, but my challenge is the creative. I don't want to do ads around bad creative. Mm. You know what I mean? And I don't think I've quite mastered yet. This is where my 20 year old daughter who started working with me on the conscious beauty collective, she's a designer. She's going to be yeah. taking over my TikTok ads. So if we talk in a month or two, I think I'll have more to contribute because I'll see hopefully a big shift in, and cause I approach it as, you know, a 56 year old woman doing it. It's not attractive. Mm -hmm. It's like, nobody wants like, to see me on there. Nobody, you yeah. know what I mean? Like I, I just, <laughs> It's just, I gotta, I gotta think about it differently. It's hard though, because I'm not in that mindset as a, a heavy user as like my daughter is. So she's get, she gets it. Now today you're answering questions before I even ask you, you know, because I was going to ask you, like you said at the very beginning of this episode, you said that you're not, I shouldn't be that intimidated because the landscape has changed dramatically. So you're like a newbie yourself. So I was going to ask, I was going to ask if you're like getting any help outside, you know, freelancers, content creators, social media people. So apart from your daughter, are you getting any help? Yeah. So Shopify collabs is great because we get a lot of UGC that way. I also use sample size mm -hmm. social and they give me content every month, which is also helpful. And then my son is a, he's 22. He's a data science yeah. major. And he oh. has been doing an yeah, he's been doing an internship this summer at MRM and ad agency. And mm -hmm. so he started basically schooling me on um, some of the things that I need to be improving. And so this is a family business. Yeah, that <laughs> it is. And but it's been great because sometimes you get so in it in the weeds that you don't see things that other people see and you need somebody to point it out. And then when they do, yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, I know. Like it's obvious, right? You go, oh, yeah. But um, having like that fresh perspective can be really valuable. And having somebody yeah. again, 22 year old or 20 year old taking a look at my social and going, oh, I can't believe you posted that. <laughs> then you're like, all right, fair enough. You actually saw that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like just as you're saying, when you're so much invested into something, it's really hard for some time, like sometimes to take a step back and take a look at the big picture and understand where is your like mistakes. So like you receive a lot of traffic from Pinterest. I, this is the last question on marketing. So you're receiving a lot of traffic from Pinterest. And what are your strategies on your website to retain those people and to actually make the sales? So we've dabbled with a lot of different things on our website. Um, the latest thing that I've done, which, well, I've done a few things, but the things that I think have been helping, first of all, there's one click upsell, which gives people offers mm. post purchase or a checkout. It can be a little annoying because yeah. you're getting, you know, you check out and you get the pop up and then you say no and you get another pop up, but it's effective. You know, we have an attention span of a goldfish yeah. as a, you know, as people. So I do think, you know, you, you have to get over your own, like my own anxiety about doing some of those things because I don't love it, but it works. Um, so there's that. And then we also incorporated, if you probably saw on our website, um, shoppable video, UGC videos. Yeah. So we have a carousel on our homepage. We use Tolstoy is our, um, our video. We're using Tolstoy. We're using Tolstoy. Um, and yeah. so we have it in, in our, homepage. And then we also have it on the product pages where people are speaking to specific products. And I do think that really helps with conversion because people can hopefully see somebody that has the hair like theirs. Mm -hmm. 
and hear mm -hmm. them talk about their experience with the product. Cause that's important. And when you're selling hair care, skincare is, you know, a lot of times if people go to the site and they see people that look different than them, they think, Oh, that's not for me. That hair does, you know, so it's like, you have to figure out how to, especially if you're like us, our formula was intended to work for just about everybody. You know, you have to figure out how to get that message across, but not seeming generic, like, yeah. You know, yeah, like we, I asked this because we used Tolstoy in the past for doing podcasts because we thought it was a brilliant idea to uh, send people our Tolstoy link and, you know, they will, they was going to, you know, uh, answer the questions there and I was going to, you know, put everything together, make a podcast episode and put it on Spotify, but it didn't work. Apparently it wasn't that bright. But it's <laughs> like it's it's a great way to you know collect user generated content. So you mentioned upsell, you mentioned Tolstoy. What other tools that you're using? So we have subscriptions. We use Yapo for su subscriptions. We used to use Recharge, Yapo. but we we the reason we moved to Yapo is because we already do reviews with them, and there's a benefit in my opinion to trying to consolidate. We actually did the same thing with email and SMS. We, we were on Clavio. Then everybody kept saying, oh, mm -hmm. you got to use Attentive for SMS. They're the best. They're the best. So we moved to Attentive. Yeah. And then we felt like it wasn't as, it just wasn't as seamless as Cla working with Clavio, even though maybe, you know, they're a bit more sophisticated. We're a baby brand. We don't need that level of personalization at where we're at. We don't do that many SMSs. So it was like, you know what? It's better to integrate it back with Clavio. We moved back to Clavio. So I just think it's where you are in your cycle of what you're doing yeah, and sure. thinking about all the different, because you could go crazy plugging in apps all day long. I mean, there's yeah, so yeah. many, there right? There are lots of alternatives. Yeah, there are so many. Lots so of many. Are you relying on recommendations for choosing the best apps or you, know, you just go out to Shopify app store or Google or. Oh, no, apps or always recommendations. And this is where the conscious beauty collective is super helpful because we all compare notes. Mm -hmm. We have a giant spreadsheet where everybody put in all the different apps and platforms they use so that we can compare. Wow. So when I'm like, Hey, I, we use smile for our loyalty program. What do I, you know, then, then mm -hmm. other people are like, Oh, check out this one or look at that. Or, you know, it's just really helpful. Um, because yeah, you know, you can go online and read reviews, but let's face it. We all know those are not necessarily reflective of your brand, your category, your situation. So. Yeah. And like, what do you think about native Shopify yet, especially considering the Shopify summer editions 2023 that were published a couple of days ago? Like they brought a lot of alternatives, the apps that are already existing in the app store, yeah. but in their native platform. So what are you thinking about those apps? So similar to sort of, I kind of just said the opposite, but it's almost like sometimes I'm willing to go with somebody who I don't think is the expert for convenience sake. So I did that with yeah. Shopify collabs. I'm not sure that it's the best affiliate program out there. It's certainly not the most robust. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it probably lacks a lot of features, but because it's so mm -hmm. seamlessly integrated that somebody can, can basically click on the link, register, um, get an affiliate code that's, I don't have to input the discount code in there. It automatically generates it. It automatically yeah. gives them a link and then it automatically tracks the sales. And then it automatically puts the gift and puts it into my shipping, um, software. I, so it just, because it's so automated, it's worth it. So I'm willing to take sort of a less robust program because mm -hmm. it saves me so much time. So that's the case where it's worth it. There are other cases where like the subscriptions, I, I don't know. I think, I think Yadpo, even though they're not necessarily an expert, it's a new program for them, but because they integrate with the reviews and with other things, I just feel like they're putting more attention there in order to make it successful. Yeah. So I feel better about that. Um, so it really depends on the service or the, the, the thing that you're trying to solve 
Um, Cause sometimes using the Shopify version is perfectly good. And other times I would mm -hmm. say mm, you could do better by, by plugging some, something in, you know? Yeah, I understand. And just as when we're talking about automation, are you using AI tools when you're doing business? More and more I am, and it scares the shit out of me, but I yeah. am using, well, yeah, because I mean, if you read any of those, um, you know, futurists, they say that AI is the number one dem cause of the demise of humanity. Yeah, they say more so. so than climate change, nuclear bombs, anything else. Every, everyone that does this research says, um, we are more likely to have humanity come to an end because of AI. But anyway, putting that aside, I am using it and I like it, um, because it saves me a ton of time and, and money. I do, um, a lot of, um, AI generated images. I use studio.trend.io, which is free. Um, and you can create product images. Now I have to feed the Amazon beast. Amazon posts yeah. you can do every day, but the one catch of an Amazon post, if people don't know this, you can't repeat a, an image twice. Amazon won't let you post the same image mm -hmm. twice. So that's, if wow. you want to be post, and the good thing is you can schedule them in advance. So what I'll do is I'll spend a Sunday afternoon and I'll schedule like three months worth of, worth of Amazon posts, but I need three months worth of content. So that's where the AI generated stuff is brilliant because I can literally just churn out different, you know, different versions of visuals and, and I'm set. Um, I've started to use it for things like reviewing Amazon reviews to see if they're in, um, like somebody gives me a bad review to check if yeah. they're, if they're going against the Amazon policy. And I actually found a couple that were, and where it's able to get them removed because, they, the AI basically told me, chat GPT told me it was, um, violating policy. Great. I also started using them to like, give me thought starters for keywords, blog posts, things like that. So I try not to cut and paste when it's copy, mm -hmm. but I try to use it more as like, oh, that's an idea. Great. Like now it saved me a whole bunch of time and it gave me something to start with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Shopify also introduced its own AI system. Did you heard of that? I have not seen that. Yeah, it, like a couple of weeks ago, I guess they introduced their AI project called The Sidekick. And they say like the Shopify merchants are heroes to them and every hero need a sidekick, that wow. sort of stuff. So they are introducing the sidekick as an assistant to you that will be helping you each and every way, like each and every possible transaction you're doing on Shopify. So you will be able to, you know, create products easily by just asking the AI, you will be able to create promotions, discounts, bundles, everything. So it will also be a great help to Shopify merchants. So I love that in the coming days. Yeah. And like, I'm very interested to see where the AI model will, how will develop in the future, because, you know, obviously just as you're saying, the AI is also <laughs> scaring the shit out of me and I don't know, I don't know. We'll see. So, um, Nick, Lynn, I ask you a great many of questions and I really enjoyed the episode, but we're coming to the end of this podcast. So is there anything else you would like to share before closing? Um, read your ingredient labels and your beauty products, people. You'll be shocked at what's in them. <laughs> and if you don't understand what is written on them, like they should probably Google it, right? Google it or ask chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can also be a way. Uh, so Lynn, thank you for being here and sharing you. your inspirational story. I, like I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch, obviously. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Here. This was fun. Bye. Yeah, me too. Bye-bye.